Good afternoon. I met Jonathan Jones, where is he? <laughs> By here. In Groveland Prison many years ago. And when he came out on parole, I thought uh, he would make a good teammate. He would represent the new age of nonviolence, while I represent the old age of nonviolence. So we're a team, and we go out and speak together. I want to invite you to partner up with the person sitting next to you. And I want one member of the partnership to make a tight fist and imagine that you have the world's most precious diamond in the fist. And I want the other member to open the fist. Now tell me, tell me honestly, how many of you asked the other person to open the fist? So you see how deep violence is within us. I merely ask you to open the fist and you immediately become physical and try to pry open the fist. So my grandfather was right when he said that uh, nonviolence is very deeply rooted in us. We have built a whole culture of violence around us, a culture that is so deep within us, it has overtaken our uh, entertainment, sports, religion, language, our relationships, everything about us is violent. And that is why he said, the only way we can achieve peace in this world is by becoming the change that we wish to see. If we don't change ourselves, if we don't look at our own weaknesses and transform them, we will never be able to bring peace in this world. We are all longing for peace. We all work for peace. But if we don't know what peace looks like, we are never going to achieve it. He taught me a lesson when I was 13 years old and had the privilege of living with him. He made me draw a genealogical tree of violence. He said, the only way you can understand nonviolence is by first understanding violence itself. And he made me draw this family tree, just as we do a family tree with violence as the grandparent and physical violence and passive violence as the two branches. And every day before I went to bed, I had to analyze and examine everything that I had experienced during the day and put them down on that tree things that I may have done to other people or people may have done to me or things that I may have read about, whatever it was, all of that had to be analyzed and put on that tree. Now, physical violence is something that we understand and we know about because it hurts so much. It's all the physical manifestations of violence where we fight and kill and murder and rape and, and do all of these things using physical force. But passive violence is something that we don't recognize, we don't even know about it. Uh, sometimes uh, it's just become so deeply rooted within us that we don't even think of it as being violent. And the way I had to find out whether this is passive violence or not was to ask myself the simple question, if somebody were to do this to me, would I be hurt by it or would I be helped by it? And if I came to the conclusion that it would hurt me, then that would be passive violence. And that could take the form of anything, discrimination, oppression, suppression, wasting resources, throwing away 
uh, perfectly good things that we do in our societies all the time. I read in the New York Times not long ago that we in the United States throw away $60 billion worth of food every year, goes into the garbage. And yet we have millions of people in our own country who go to bed hungry. Now that is a form of violence too. But we don't recognize that as being violence because we don't see the hurt it causes. So it's important for us to know about the passive violence that all of us commit. And that is why grandfather made me draw this tree, which was a form of introspection. When I did get, began doing this, I was amazed that within a few months, I was able to fill up the whole wall in my room with acts of passive violence. The physical violence didn't grow very much, but the passive violence grew endlessly. And that's when grandfather explained to me the connection between the two. That we commit passive violence all the time, every day, consciously and unconsciously, and that generates anger in the victim, and the victim then resorts to physical violence to get justice. So it is passive violence that fuels the fire of physical violence. So logically, if we want to put out that fire of physical violence, we have to cut off the fuel supply. And since the fuel supply comes from each one of us, we have to become the change we wish to see in the world. It's only through changing ourselves that we will be able to change society. And if we can change society, then we will be able to bring peace in this world. This led me to coming into the prison systems and going out into the world and, and uh, planting these seeds of peace and nonviolence in the minds of people. And when I went to the first prison in uh, Philadelphia, and this was way back in 1993, Hector Ayala was one of the inmates there. And the question he asked me, he said, you want us to change, but society has already condemned us. They are never going to accept us as human beings. They, we can become saints and they will not accept us. So why should we change? And my response to him was that the day you start doing things to impress somebody, you are being very insincere. You got to change because you know that is the right thing to do. Whether anybody accepts you for it and appreciates it or not, you are going to change because that is the right thing to do. And that is what I like to tell people all the time, that change because you know that is the right thing, and that is what you want your life to be. You know, we have unconsciously given our lives to um, unknown people to determine what it's going to be. We allow ourselves to be provoked by somebody and that provocation leads us to do things that we don't really want to do. So it's important for us to know all of these things and to uh, transform our, ourselves and change ourselves so that we can make a difference in this world. That is the message I brought into the prison systems here. That is how I met Jonathan Jones, and he represents the change that uh, I've been talking about. So I will let him now tell you about the change that took place in his life. Thank you.
violence for me started in the household. I mean, I didn't want to get up in the morning to go to school, didn't want to do my chores, didn't want to come in the house when the street lights came on. I lied, I stole, and I would get whoopings. I took the violence I learned at home to the streets. On the streets, my violence escalated, and I committed violent crimes and got arrested. So as I stood in front of the judge, mother in the court wouldn't rid me crying, I realized that those whoopings that she used to give me were meant to prevent this. I was sent upstate, prison, and then that's when the shift happened for me, the shift from violence to nonviolence. It was just a simple thought. I didn't want to be punched in the face no more, nor did I want to punch anybody in the face because both hurt. So I made a decision to participate in the Alternative to Violence Project, AVP. And one of their core principles is transforming powers, transform a violent conflict to a nonviolent resolution. So I got transferred. Eventually, I ended up in Groveland Correctional Facility. At Groveland, I became an AVP facilitator and trainer. So during one of the workshops, I met a volunteer and facilitator named Shannon, and she told me about the season for nonviolence. And I was like, hmm, that's something that could be done in prison. So I discussed it with a friend of mine named Jules, and together we presented the idea to the administration. And two of the people I hear today, she was the superintendent at the time, Superintendent Moyer, and he was the DEPA programs at the time, DEPA programs uh, Cronin. So they approved it. And then the men of Groveland Correctional Facility was inspired by the season, and they began to write essays and poems about nonviolence. They began to draw pictures, read books about nonviolence. They began to write songs, sing. And then they began to do the 64-day daily reflections for, for living nonviolently. So then I was like, man, this right here is amazing. They would raise money and give the money to organizations out in the streets fighting violence. In December of 2015, I was released from prison. So I took the nonviolence I learned in prison. Yeah, that's right, I learned nonviolence in prison. I took that to the streets with me. So then on the streets, about a couple of years later, Ron, in 2015, Groveland asked me to come back in and talk about the season for nonviolence. So with Arun Gandhi, went back into Groveland. That right there was amazing. Coming back into prison, I had just got released from to talk to the men about the season of nonviolence. And some of the men that when I went home, you know, were still there. And I was like, wow, this is amazing for me. But it was more amazing after spending a couple hours at Grove and to leave the same day. That was even more amazing. So then after that, Attica asked, could you come in the Attica talk about the season of nonviolence? And then Auburn asked, could you come in Auburn and talk about the season of nonviolence? And just like the men of Groveland, the men of Attica and Auburn were touched by the power of nonviolence, right? They were touched also. So a couple of, you know, soon after I got released, I eventually started working. So I was driving a van one day, and uh, coming out of the parking lot, going to another work site. So as I pulled into the street I'm driving, a car shoots past me, and then it comes in front of me. I didn't think nothing of it. Then the car slows down, I slow down. And then the car stopped, and I smashed on my brakes, but I still hit the back of the car. I was like, wow. But then the car drove off, and then it pulled up in the parking lot. So I just kept going. I said, all right, whatever, I just kept going. I wanted to get to my work site. But I noticed that the car was following me. So as I pulled up in front of my work site, car pulled up, I jumped out the car like, what's going on? He said, yo, don't you know you cut me off? I said, hey, man. I don't think I cut y'all, but you know what? I apologize. And he looked at me, he paused, and he was like, 
all right. And then he just drove off. And you know, in that moment, I chose to be nonviolent. I value my ability to make decisions today. I value my ability to choose today. I'm not going to let circumstances dictate how I respond in situations. I choose to be nonviolent. And there's one other thing I learned from that incident also. I learned the power of a well-timed deep breath. So much could happen when you take a deep breath and you start connecting with that nonviolent side in you. Thank you.